Pablo Picasso once said that if he were to paint a horse, you might not see the horse, but you would surely see the wildness. In saying this, he tells us that the essence of the painting isn't the horse, but the wildness. The dictionary defines essence as that which makes something what it is, the fundamental nature of something or its most important quality. While not using the word essence, the UUA, the Unitarian Universalist Association, or our, our national an international body, ask congregations seeking a minister to complete a form called the Congregational Record. And the Congregational Record includes this question. Does the congregation have a mission? Not a mission statement, but a glowing coal at its center. <clears throat> and if so, what is it? That single sentence, I think, is the most important question on this four-page form. What is our essence, our glowing coal? I'm not sure how many of you could answer that question on a moment's notice, but I will say that members of our Open Circle UU Fellowship 2.0 committee had some difficulty with it. And while the board has responded to this question in completing, <coughs> completing the congregational record form uh, in the process by which we sought our current consulting minister, they acknowledged that the quick turnaround required did not allow for a full discernment process. The OCOP 2.0 committee has been charged with leading that discernment process as we move forward in making decisions about future ministerial leadership. Identifying the true shared essence of Open Circle UU Fellowship, that glowing coal at our center, what we are fundamentally about, perhaps that is the largest challenge we face as a fellowship at this time. As was noted in the letter of invitation for this summer's Dinners for Eight, fewer than half of our current members were, sh were charter members when Open Circle applied for membership into the Unitarian Universalist Association in 2005. As our membership has changed, and even as our charter members' goals and priorities have evolved and changed through the years, it seems that there has been less clarity and less consensus about just what is the essence or the glowing coal of Open Circle. This morning, I'd like to share my personal perspective of the essence of that faith community that a handful of people started to imagine 10 plus years ago. In doing so, I'm not necessarily asking that the image or vision be confirmed as the essence of Open Circle in 2013. But instead, I challenge us to find our spark, our glowing coal now. I further challenge us to develop a shared response to the, late, to the related question, who do we intend to be? I found a quote by a person named Max Dupree who says, leadership is a function of questions. And the first question for a leader always is, who do we intend to be? Not what are we going to do, but who do we intend to be? It is only after being clear about who we intend to be can we decide what we should be doing. That is exactly the point that consultants for churches or, organ or other organizations make when they talk about being mission driven. How do our actions and expenditures support the mission of the organization? Or how does what we propose to do support who we intend to be? Along with your order of service this morning, you should have gotten a little half sheet of paper 
on which you create your own adaptation of Picasso's quote and provide your thoughts as to what you intend for Open Circle to be. Does anyone need one of those papers? Did you not get one? Or anyone need a pen, pen to complete that? As we get those distributed to, to everyone, I'm, I'm going to give you permission to, to write during my sermon and invite you to form your responses to those questions and jot down any comments. Um, I'm not sure whether we're going to have much time at the end for, for talk back, but what you write and what you, you uh, at, at following the service or following the sermon, we will collect the offering. And you will have the opportunity then to put both your financial gifts and the gift of your intentions for our fellowship of the basket. So do feel free to, to write and make some notes as I go along. As most of you know, the impetus for the formation of Open Circle came from our family's need for a church that would truly welcome and affirm our gay daughter and others seeking similar welcome and affirmation. Today, I would like to share my intentions, my hopes and dreams from the beginning of what has become Open Circle UU Fellowship. I acknowledge that I hope that in naming these things that provided that flowing coal from the beginning, that these things might be embraced more fully by the fellowship. But if not, then as I said before, it is my hope that you, the gathered fellowship that is now open circle here in 2013, find that glowing coal. Or if nothing is glowing, then find that spark to ignite the coal that will light and empower open circle into the future. Personally, I can identify four things that were at the essence of the faith community I hoped we were creating 10 years ago. And those four things are, one, a passion for social justice. Two, that we are a religious community. Three, that we would be open and welcoming to, to all seekers. We are not a house church or a closed group and four, that it was about creating community. Finally, I suppose number five would be that it was about bringing all of these four things together. As I think there were opportunities to pursue these four things singularly or in some combination in other places in the community, but we couldn't find a place that brought them all together, and that's what we sought to do when Open Circle was formed. As I've said, Open Circle was born around a social justice issue, LGBT inclusion and equality. And given the changes that have occurred on this issue in the last 10 years, it's hard to realize that at that time, even though there were churches that weren't actively preaching against LGBT, LGBT equality, there were none that were willing to speak openly for it. In fact, they really didn't want to talk about it at all. And the church that we left actually took a vote saying, we don't want to talk about this anymore. Okay. Aside from the Gay Straight Alliance at Fond du Lac High School, which our daughter was involved in forming, from the beginning, Open Circle was a lone voice in the community for LGBT equality. And we provided some bold and very visible leadership in this area. Open Circle provided the leadership and base for canvassing against the constitutional amendment prohibiting marriage equality. We assembled a group of over 40 to march in a Labor Day parade in support of LGBT equality in Fond du Lac. We held a breaking silence event that helped to move some public officials toward a broader and more inclusive support for diversity and provided the impetus for the formation of a support group within the Holy Family Catholic Parish for families with LGBT members. We had an impact on this issue. Sometimes, though, success can be your own worst enemy. 
And as progress was made on LGBT issues, those involved struggled to find new directions for this work, as well as perhaps being distracted by other tasks within the fellowship, including renovating and moving into this new building, and moving from two Sundays a month services to services every Sunday. While our Eco Food Group has remained a consistent voice in the fellowship and the larger community on the social and environmental impacts of what we eat, Open Circle's voice on other social justice issues seems to have diminished some in recent years. Another challenge to consistent and visible social justice ministry is that while there might be some level of consensus on supporting or working for social justice in the abstract, the devil, as always, is in the details. For example, several years ago, as some members voiced concerns and passed petitions in response to the actions of our governor that put Wisconsin in the national and international news, others raised questions and concerns about whether we were quote, being too political, unquote. In another example, some members of our fellowship who had participated in previous community Martin Luther King Day events raised questions about the appropriateness of honoring Dr. King, an eloquent and fervent opponent of the Vietnam War, by asking elementary school students to write letters to service members thanking them for protecting our country. When these concerns were not addressed to our satisfaction, some of us chose not to participate in this event, only to find some weeks later that an RE class activity here at Open Circle asked our students to write similar letters. An additional irony of this assignment, uh, which was a part of our UUA curriculum, was that it was also close in time to a Sunday when an announcement was made inviting adults to picket at the local military recruiting office. The inclusion of the letter writing assignment in the curriculum was addressed at an open circle board meeting, and the majority view was that since it was in the UU, UUA curriculum, it was okay. A position that still leaves me a little uncomfortable. These examples, though, highlight the challenges of differing views and understandings of the connection of faith and justice, how we individually define justice, and questions about how we can most effectively work for greater justice. These are all questions and issues that we must address if social justice is to truly be a blowing hole for us. both the OCUF 2.0 committee and the Open Circle Board are reading this excellent, excellent little book titled The Growing Church, Keys to Congregational Vitality. The various chapters are written by UU ministers of rapidly growing UU congregations who were invited to participate in a series of discussions about how their congregations have grown in spirituality, membership, and mission. I'll be drawing from this book throughout my remarks this morning. In the final chapter of the book, Tom Beloit, the book's editor, has put together a church growth inventory. And we'll be looking at this, um, the committee and the board together uh, in the coming weeks. This inventory includes these questions. Does your congregation actively announce its, its values to the wider community? Is its justice work undertaken consciously and publicly as a manifestation of its faith? He then goes on to distinguish between bunker churches and beacon churches. He says a bunker church faces inward and is a place where people hunker down. He says that members of a bunker church consider it their refuge, their oasis in the middle of a desert, their bastion of liberal thought. By contrast, he says, a beacon church announces its presence in the community and boldly proclaims its values, 
its mission, and its identity. He goes on to note that our aptly named UUA Beacon Press published the Pentagon Papers and that a bunker press would never do such a thing. Open Circle began as a Beacon Church. And while some may disagree with me, my sense is that we have started to inch more toward a bunker church model. Personally, I see that reflected in several statements that are made in the congregational record document that was submitted uh, as we were recruiting our minister. One of these statements says, quote, some see spiritually grounded activism as the center of why they want to join together in spiritual community, while others experience our spiritual community more as a spiritual haven or safe place to find spiritual renewal. While some might argue that a spiritual haven isn't the same as a bunker, my sense is that that becomes closer to bunker than beacon. In any case, a spiritual haven church would need a different type minister than a beacon church. So it's important as a fellowship that we have a clear understanding of who we intend to be. For me, a second essential element of Open Circle from the beginning was that we were a religious or faith group. I remember very distinctly some critical turning points on this. One of these was at an early planning group where we were making decisions about speakers for our first few months. A prominent person in the community was suggested to speak on a topic for which she was widely known. And I asked if she would be able to bring a spiritual or religious dimension to the topic, noting that I wasn't interested in simply creating a Sunday morning forum with interesting speakers who might just as well be heard in other places. Some discussion ensued, and a decision was made which moved us toward defining ourselves more clearly as a religious or spiritual group. I think this direction was also reaffirmed when the decision was made uh, in our first year, and again with some discussion, to pursue a student minister for our second year of services. I think that decision set us on a different path than some of the other small emerging fellowships in our area. Given that social justice was the major impetus for the formation of Open Circle, one might ask, why start a faith community? Some of you have heard me say that two things distinguish Open Circle or Unitarian Universalism generally from the MacArthur Foundation, which as a foundation is committed to building a more just, verdant, and peaceful world. All things we as you use are committed to and want to work for. But I would say that the first difference is that UU, at least to some degree, defines itself as a religion. And second, the MacArthur Foundation has lots of money, and we don't. <laughs> so why not just give money to the MacArthur Foundation, or support the Human Rights Campaign, or Fair Wisconsin, or whatever social justice or advocacy groups support your values, or assist those in need. <clears throat> I must admit that I personally have struggled with this question a good bit, and in fact, at times, continue to struggle with it. In terms of dollars invested, any number of organizations might be able to use my financial contributions more effectively in working to bring about the social change I hope for. And even now, it is hard for me to explain why I felt the need to try to create a religious or faith community rather than just financially support secular charities or social justice groups. The easy answer might simply be that I had always been rooted in a faith community. And even though my local congregation certainly weren't on the forefront in addressing social justice issues, I did have an awareness of denominational leadership positions on important issues such as civil rights, war, and more recently, LGBT rights. 
Also, I have long recognized that my faith calls me to a lifestyle that is, at least to some degree, countercultural. And I seek and desire the support of others in trying to live that calling. Some years ago, while I was being recruited for a volunteer position uh, training uh, by an LBG advocacy group, I had indicated that much of my LGBT activism had been done through my UU congregation. It was only toward the very end of the conversation that the recruiter told me that he too was UU. And he said, being UU helps me live my best life. At its best, this community is a place of spiritual nurture and sustenance and has helped me live my best life. But I think we could do that more consistently and better if we were truly committed that that was part of what we are really about. In the spiritual and theological diversity that characterizes Open Circle and UU generally, I have come to sense a real ambivalence about our identity as a religion. While the UUA has used the tagline, nurture your spirit, help heal the world, as an invitation to UU, it seems to me that our ambivalence about being religious and our lack of shared spiritual practices and traditions might impede our ability to do either. As a fellowship, it seems we continue to struggle without a shared language of the sacred to speak of matters of the soul, even though we have had some ministers who have modeled this well for us. The Reverend Marilyn Sewell, one of the UU ministers writing in the Growing Church book, addresses this as a pattern she sees within UU. She writes, there is a kind of fear of the holy that may be the chief culprit in our movement's powerlessness. We are afraid to be too religious. Hoping to offend no one, we shrink from religious language and end up with verbiage that loses all force and specificity. We avoid our Judeo-Christian roots while borrowing copiously from the religious traditions that are far from our cultural moorings and history. I was, I was in the building yesterday setting a few things up and tidying up a bit, and I found on the back bulletin board uh, a one-page article that was in the UUA magazine at least a year and a half, if not two years ago, so it's been on our bulletin board a long time. And it was a topic of discussion at our uh, UU Women's Coffee Group written by our, uh, the UUA president, Reverend Morales. It's titled, Get Religion. And while it's been on the bulletin board a while, and we've talked about it a little bit, I don't think we, as a congregation, have really struggled with what he's, he says in that article. We have no real consensus about whether we agree or disagree with what he says. I've certainly observed, if not a fear of being too religious, certainly a reluctance, sometimes even to identify as religious. So much so that we often want to use the word spiritual and avoid the word religion. We shy away from owning the word religious, even while struggling to articulate a clear, a clear and shared distinction between the terms religious and spiritual. This distinction is a frequent topic of conversation in our women's coffee group. In one recent conversation, I said that I tended to see spiritual as describing an individual's practice to find one's center or connection to the holy, while religion happens when we come together to do that in community, noting that I understood that the words religion and ligament come from the same root, meaning that which binds us together. And both readings this morning, both the, the unison reading and the responsive reading, make reference to being bound together. Um, and that creates some discomfort for some people. And uh, um, uh, 
a lot of, we, we hear, you know, I'm spiritual but not religious. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean I do my spirituality on my own? If we come together in community, is that what makes us religious as opposed to spiritual? I don't know. In addition to our ambiguous feelings toward being religious, I think the very richness of what we call our seven UU sources poses some, its own challenges. And for those of you who aren't familiar with these, they can be found in the first few pages of our hardback hymnal. It is difficult enough to have reasonable depth in, of knowledge and understanding in the teachings of one religion, let alone many. So when we as UUs draw upon the wisdom from the world's religions, it seems generally that we can only draw superficially. So that when, for example, we devote our one Sunday a year to Buddhism, that ends up being some variation on an introduction to the Eightfold Path and not much more. I think we must always be careful as you use that we don't become a bad smorgasbord, offering lots of choices, but nothing that is really nourishing or even appealing. Recently, while ruffling through some old files from Open Circle's first years, I found written participant feedback uh, from our May 2004 discernment service, where we made the decision to organize as a faith community and to seek affiliation with the UUA. In response to the request to identify three or four things that would be most important to him or her in a faith community, Paisley Harris wrote that it would be important to be spiritual together not just learning about different spiritualities. As we make efforts within the fellowship to incorporate many different spiritualities, it seems that we sometimes are simply learning about them and not being spiritual together. I don't really know how it is that you do that, but I think it's something that we should seek and try to figure out. I look forward in a couple of weeks, uh, as mentioned before, Scott Prinster will be with us. And he's been invited by our OCUF 2.0 to address the challenges and the strengths of our, our uh, spiritual and theological diversity as you use. And so I hope all of you will plan to uh, be a part of that service. Siebel's critique of unity Tearing universalism challenges you use generally and open circles specifically to address our ambivalence about being religious and to get in touch with our Judeo-Christian roots. Given our theological and spiritual diversity, can we truly, in Paisley's words, be spiritual together in ways that reflect and honor that diversity? Can we or do we wish to develop a clearer religious identity and embrace sacred language that has power and meaning. If we find a way to do that, I think we might just discover a glowing coal. The third essential trait that I brought to the beginnings of Open Circle was that it would be open and welcoming place for any and all seekers. This was perhaps the most fundamental decision for what was to become Open Circle. As I gave some real thought to the possibility of creating a house church that would be small and private. I had already formed a circle group which met about once or twice a month and which provided important spiritual support and direction for me during my wilderness time after leaving my previous church. Several of that group are in open circle, Karen Lindbergh Shupi and Linda Moore. While others in that group, and I've, I've just been thinking about this recently, seem to have come into my life at that time of acute spiritual need with relatively little contact before or since. <coughs> One of those graces. Additionally, I knew some people who were in a fairly long established house church. And that was a concept that was appealing on several levels. It would be a way of hopefully meeting my need and desire for spiritual community. And it would be fairly simple, 
and without significant financial cost. And it was certainly easier than trying to start a new church. Simple, easy, cheap. The concept certainly had some appeal. I'm not quite sure what moved me away from the house church concept, other than the recognition that there must be others who shared my need and desire for a liberal faith community with a commitment to social justice. Perhaps more important than anything else was my own sense of pain and loneliness at this time. I remember distinctly that shortly after leaving my previous church, I heard a quote from Mother Teresa, Teresa twice in one week. She said, loneliness is the worst form of poverty. I don't know if I had ever heard that quote before, but I do know that was the first time those words stuck with me. I was experiencing that poverty. Peter Morales, president of the UUA, says that growing our movement is not an institutional need. Growing Unitarian Universalism is a moral imperative. It is the moral equivalent of feeding the hungry and house, <coughs> housing the homeless. Morales writes a chapter on welcoming in the Growing Church book and goes on to cite studies and statistics which he says represent spiritual and emotional starvation that is growing at an alarming rate. Morales reminds us that being welcoming goes far beyond a friendly greeting at the door or talking with someone during coffee hour. Fundamentally, we must feed their souls. And beyond that, we need to help newcomers make connections immediately and then nurture those connections so they extend beyond the church setting. Morales notes that it's long been known that the best predictor of whether someone becomes a long-term member of a church is the number of friendships he or she forms in the church within the first six months. A number of our members who have joined Open Circle in recent years came as friends of already active members. And certainly this is one of the most effective forms of outreach and church growth. However, I fear sometimes that when a stranger comes to us, someone without pre-existing connections, perhaps a newcomer in the community, that we don't provide the kind of welcome they need, where they are helped to build a sense of community that goes beyond Sunday mornings or beyond the church's planned programs and events, but includes an invitation to coffee or lunch, a play date for their child, <coughs> or making sure their holidays are celebrated with someone. These are way we, ways we not only extend welcome, but we can address that worst form of poverty, loneliness. Perhaps fundamentally, that is why Open Circle was born. And fundamentally, that is why we should grow up. Finally, I identified community as that fourth trait that I saw at the essence of what I was seeking 10 years ago as I was beginning to imagine what has become Open Circle. However, there's a reason that speakers traditionally incorporate three points in their presentations and not four or more, and that is time. I hope that we might devote future service to this topic and continue to hold community central in our discussions of Open Circle. But for now, I will simply suggest that the, West, that the best way of creating community is by passionately pursuing justice, by being spiritual together, which just might be the best definition of being religious, and by welcoming and feeding the spiritually hungry. Admittedly, there are risks in asking Open Circle to more clearly define both who we are and who we intend to be. For it opens up the possibility of disagreement and even conflict. Additionally, I think you use may actually see ambiguity in certain aspects of our identity as a way of being open and welcoming. 
I feel that I've taken some personal risk in saying some of what I've said today, but change, movement, and growth usually do involve risk. Yet failure to intentionally change and grow also holds certain risks which are often ignored. So I hope that just as so many of you enthusiastically have joined the Dinners for Eight and started this conversation about Open Circle's future, that you will continue this conversation as we take it deeper throughout this program year. I hope that you will discuss what I've said this morning, whether you agree or disagree, and that together in this process, Open Circle names its true essence and discovers that glowing coal, or perhaps several glowing coals at our center. I've seen some of you writing as I've